From Hollywood, it's time now for Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Spell it. J-O-H-N-N-Y-D-O-L-L-A-R. That's not right. You forgot to capitalize. Hey, you're right, honey. Let me hear you spell your name. Okay. Capital J, I L L, Jill. Capital O, apostrophe. Apostrophe. I never can say that. Capital D, A R E, oh dear. Of course, my last name's actually something else. I forget. But my mother says I'm really an O'Dair. Not the least doubt about it. I can see it in a minute. I like you, Johnny Dollar. And I kind of like you, too, Jill O'Dare. You think my mother's pretty? I think she's lovely. Then why don't you get married to her so I can have a daddy? Well, that's, um... Well, it's certainly something to think about. And, uh, not a bad idea. Now, I'll uh, be quiet before you wake her up. I'm already awake. And with a plot like that being hatched, I think I'd better stay awake. Is there coffee, Johnny? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location, a small cabin in the timber outside Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Nick Shern matter. Expense account, final page. Item 15, $1 million for a certain feeling. I realize, of course, that the amount of this item is somewhat unusual and may be cause for mild criticism by your accounting department, unless the accompanying report includes an adequate and detailed explanation. Therefore, to avoid unnecessary correspondence and delay, I am attaching said explanation herewith. Here's your coffee, Kathy. Thanks. How long did I sleep, Johnny? Oh, a couple of hours. It's around four in the morning. The storm hasn't let up at all, has it? Oh, it's worse, if anything. Jill, honey, it's four o'clock in the morning and your eyes are just about to fall out. Now, you go back there and go to sleep. Do I have to, Mommy? You have to. Run along now. Mr. Johnny Dollar and me were having a lot of fun till you woke up. <laughs> well, that's life, sweetie. Night now. Good night, Jill. Good night. Proud of her? I'm crazy about her. That's what you mean. She's a great little girl. She's the only thing I ever did in my whole life that turned out right. That bad, huh? Johnny, it's no good. I know why you're here. I know what you expect from me, and the answer's no. You're jumping the gun. I haven't asked you anything. You will. You haven't done all this for nothing. You're going to ask me to come back to New York and testify against Nick Shearn. I might ask you to tell the truth... Is that just another way of wording it? I didn't see anything, hear anything. I don't know anything about it, and I have nothing to say. So Nick Shearn gets away with another murder. I wouldn't know anything about that. And sooner or later, of course, he'll kill you, too. He sent Benny Stark out to do it, and Benny missed. But he's got other boys, or he might even handle the job himself. Why? By now, he ought to know that I'm not going to tell. But there's always that chance you might change your mind. And Nick's a gambler, but he likes the odds on his side. He doesn't take chances... Whenever he can, he stacks the deck. I wish I could help you, Johnny. But I don't know anything about it. I left before it happened. How long have you worked for Nick Shearn? Known him? Two years. I'm not wide-eyed about him, Johnny. I've heard what he's been, what he may even still be, a gangster, hoodlum, racketeer, but that's none of my business. The club was, was legitimate. My job there was on the level, and... He never got out of line, once. And no doubt he's always been kind to his mother and loves dogs and children. I wouldn't know, except children. He's crazy about them. He was always buying something for Jill, asking about her. And he also shot and killed Mel Pryker. I couldn't say. I see. Well, you're letting a lot of people down. People here in Brambury that you grew up with, people that love you... Your father, Dan Martin. What have they got to do with it? You know, it's a great country up here. I'd like to spend more time in it. And it's big country, big and beautiful and dangerous. Like that blizzard outside there. 
It's not the kind of country that turns out cowards. Cowards? Your father said something yesterday. That some people belong in cities and some don't. And that you're one of the second kind. He was right. The city's made a coward of you. You don't understand. And they know it. Old Mike, Dan, all of them. Of course, they'll never mention it. But you're letting them down, and they know it. And you know it, Kathy. They don't have a daughter to think of. It's not her fear we're talking about. It's yours. All right, I'm scared. I've got reason to be. It's easy for you to talk. You don't know what fear is, what it can do to you. I don't. It can push you and drive you and make you do things you hate yourself for. And it can destroy you. How would you know? How would any of them know? Who haven't felt it, who haven't been there. Kathy, you're not alone. We've all been there. It's not the fear that's important. It's the courage you bring up to fight it. I've tried. I've I've nearly gotten crazy trying to think it out. But it always comes back to one thing. Jill. She's what counts. Nothing else matters. And if you love her, teach her to grow up without fear. Sacrifice anything if you have to, even your life. But teach her courage. There's nothing greater you could do for her. <laughs> It's all right, Kathy. It's all right. It's all right. I knew what was right, Johnny. I knew all the time. Sure, sure. Of course you did. All you needed was a little push. Want to tell me about it now? I... I was there at the club that night. When it happened, I stayed after closing. I had some presents for Jill, and I wanted to wrap them before I took them home. Nick and Mel Pryker were upstairs in the office. Nick was there? Yes. I could hear them arguing. They didn't know I'd stayed. And then... Go on. I heard Mel yell out. He said, no, Nick, no. And then I heard the shots. Yes? I didn't even think. I ran up to the office. Mel was lying on the floor, and Nick was standing there with a gun. He told me to get out and to keep quiet if I wanted to keep on living. That's it, huh? Yes. Would you make a statement to the police, testify at the trial? Yes. Oh, good. Will you help me, Johnny? Will you stand by me? You know I will. You've got to because I'm scared. I'll be scared all the way, but I'll do it if you'll help me. I'll help you, Kathy, all the way. Why don't you curl up here and get some sleep? Come on. Maybe now I can sleep. It's going to be all right. Thanks, Johnny, for giving me the push. Oh, sure, honey. You know something, Johnny? I'm with Jill. I like you, too. She went to sleep with her face against my chest. And after a while, little Jill came tiptoeing in and curled up on the other side. And I sat there holding them both, thinking and waiting for the dawn. So that's what I mean about a million-dollar feeling. True, it wasn't my little girl, or my big girl either. But for the moment at least, well, that item still goes. I'll still tag that feeling at one million dollars. And I was sorry when the storm was over and a rescue party came out from town. Because I felt I'd had one moment in a lifetime that I'd never find again. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round the fire. The big event of the year in Brambury was the Christmas Eve show in the town hall. There was music and a pageant and singing, and everybody took part in it, from the youngest kid in town to the toughest old grizzled lumberjack from the back hills. Jill was in the children's chorus, and old Mike was to operate the spotlight, so they went on ahead. I took Kathy. And since she wasn't quite ready to face people yet, we made a point of getting there late. I didn't care when we got there, as long as I was with her. We slipped in quietly and took seats at the back of the room. The string group from the high school orchestra was playing, and no one noticed us. Not even old Mike, Kathy's father, who was working the spotlights. I hope Jill does all right. She hasn't had any time to practice with us. Oh, she'll do all right. We'd been there about ten minutes when somebody else came in and slid into the one seat between us and the door. I didn't look around until I felt Kathy stiffen beside me. Oh, no. It was Nick Shearn. Nobody gets excited now or makes any sudden moves. We just sit here quiet like. He slid his hand over to feel inside my coat under my arm. Now back in around, huh? Perfect. I'd left my gun at Kathy's house. Old Mike had been dubious about it, but with Benny dead, I'd seen no reason to carry it. 
And after all, it was Christmas Eve. All right, now we're going to ease out of here now without attracting no attention from anybody. You're crazy, Nick. You're crazy. Shut up and just don't forget one thing, Dollar. I'm not holding this gun on you. You see him right at the middle of Kathy's back. Let's go. Johnny. No choice, Kathy. Come on. The back of the room was dark. Nobody paid any attention. Somebody was always leaving or coming back in. Come on. I got a car over at the side. Here. Johnny. Watch it, dollar. We'll be right back, Mike. Just gonna get some air. All right, Johnny. But don't go running out before I give you your present. Huh? Here. And don't uncork that until you're ready for some serious business. All right, I'll... I'll re... Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it. Good luck, Johnny. Yeah, come on, let's get away from here. Johnny, he's going... Take it easy, Kathy. Wait for me! Oh, what... Oh, no. Jill, go back! I want to see Uncle Nick! Why did you tell me you were coming here to hear me sing Uncle Nick? Well, uh... uh listen... Pick me Jill... up? Please, Uncle Nick. Take your hands out of your pocket and pick me up. Uh, look, Jill, you run along now... Who's that? Dan Martin. He's a deputy sheriff, and he's a dead shot. Better do like she says, Nick. Take your hand out of your pocket and pick her up. Uncle Nick? All right, reach in my pocket, Johnny, and take my gun. Later, Kathy and I walked around outside. We could still hear the children's chorus singing inside. Jill saved our lives tonight. No, she saved Nick's life. What do you mean? That present your father gave me, up there at the spotlights. He could see what was happening, and he thought real fast. That present was a gun. Then you... I had Nick covered from the time we stepped off the porch. I'm glad he didn't move. I'm glad it happened like it did. Yeah, so am I. I thought we'd never see those stars up there again. You kept hold of yourself, Kathy. You showed a lot of courage. No. But maybe I can learn to show it. I was just thinking, Johnny, looking at the stars up there. There was fear in the world then. Two thousand years ago. And he had courage. Expense account item 16, $230.40. Incidentals in Bramberry and transportation for two adults and one child. Bramberry to New York. Expense account total, $486.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you, from all of us here on the program. And God bless you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Don Diamond, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Sam Edwards, and Ken Christie. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>